This is your Daily Scripture for August 19th. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's Feeding Station. It's an honor to be with you again today as we continue in 1 Corinthians. I uh, hope you had a good weekend, by the way. Um, I hope it's uh, the summer's winding down here pretty quickly, but I uh, hope you had a great weekend, and uh, thanks for being here. We continue in 1 Corinthians, a couple of more days, chapter 15 today. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, Then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly 
is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised to power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. A lot to, uh, well, a lot to digest today. One of the most, probably one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And we're going to talk about, uh, well, we're going to answer this question. Why is the story of the resurrection so important? Isn't it just enough that Christ died on the cross? No. Christ was raised to show that what happens to those who believe in him, that is the evidence, right? Right. Christ was raised as the first fruits. We will be raised from the dead in a, in a similar way. And so Paul says, if you don't believe in the resurrection, if you take that position, right? Because the, 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 the general idea in Corinth was that dead men don't rise. They just don't. And Paul says, if that's the case, that means Jesus hasn't risen. And if that's the case, then our faith is trashed. Totally undone. And the, the resurrection in and of itself proves uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, truth is stronger than fiction. When you look at John 8, Jesus says, now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. Jesus came and revealed the true nature of God to all of us. It's, it's there for all of us to see, to grasp, to understand. The religious leaders wanted him dead because their false system was in peril now because of the message and the truth that Jesus brought. They didn't want the false view of faith to be destroyed because that was a threat to their power structure. And so if they, they thought if they could kill him, then they would hold on to this religion of legalism that they had built over the years. 
And if they would have succeeded in destroying Jesus, right? If there was no resurrection, if they killed him and that was the end of it, then the lies would prove to be stronger than the truth that Jesus claimed to proclaim. Does that make sense? So if they kill Jesus and he does not rise again, then everything he said was a lie. And he, their, their false system would be the one to be sustained through all of this. But the fact is that Jesus did speak the truth. And so their lies could not stand against that. And that's what the resurrection proves. It proves that Jesus was telling the truth. And it shows us that the truth is indestructible. That death and sin could not overcome God's truth. It proves that the good, the goodness of God and the grace of God and the love of God is stronger than anything Satan can produce. Again, in John 8, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, right? So this is a a battle of good versus evil here. And it is the forces of Satan that drove the Pharisees and the religious leaders to turn Jesus over. And it is the forces and the evil of Satan that crucified him through the Romans. If there is no resurrection, then Satan wins. Satan wins. And you see this, I mean, you see these types of things happening now. Forces of good versus the forces of evil. Truth versus falsehood. Truth versus lies. And you have to, like, our job is with discernment of the Holy Spirit to discern what is true and what isn't. But we know the lies of the religious leaders and the religious system of the day did not triumph over Jesus because Jesus did die, but he was raised. And he is who he says he is, which proves that everything that they all threw at him was false. The resurrection proves that love is stronger than hatred. We talked about love, the love of Jesus, the love of God last week. Right? The resurrection shows that love triumphs over hatred. Hatred is what put Jesus on the cross from a worldly perspective. From a spiritual perspective, it was love uh, that sent Jesus to the cross, his love for us, God's love for us, his desire for us to be saved. And so while evil killed him, love sacrificed him. Does that make sense? It was the evil and the hatred of him in the hearts of the Pharisees that delivered him over to the Romans to be crucified. But it was the love of God that sent him in the first place. And it was the love of Jesus that, drove him to the cross willingly, a willing sacrifice. There is a, a poem that Barclay quotes in his commentary that kind of sums everything up. He says, it says, I heard, and it's, he doesn't say who the, the author is, so I apologize for not giving credit where credit is due, but It reads like this. I heard two soldiers talking as they came down the hill, the somber hill of Calvary, bleak and black and still. And one said, the night is late. These thieves take long to die. And one said, I am sore afraid, and yet I know not why. I heard two women weeping as down the hill they came, and one was like a broken rose, and one was like a flame. One said, men shall rue this deed their hands have done. And one said only through her tears, my son, my son, my son. I heard two angels singing ere yet the dawn was bright. And they were clad in shining robes, robes and crowns of light. And one sang, death is vanquished. 
And one in golden voice sang, Love hath conquered, conquered all. O heaven and earth, rejoice. Have a great rest of your day. Lord willing, we'll talk again tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.